Good afternoon, good morning, good evening from whatever, wherever part, whichever part of the world you're listening to me be on this call from. If you can hear me, I would want you to just give me a thumbs up, um, use a smiley, just give me some reactions so I know you can hear me loud and clear. But the lot to have you on the phone. We have waited for you and we're glad to see you here. All right, I see some thumbs up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, a big hand for everyone joining us. Um, my name is Victor and I work with Secure Intelligence Limited. And we are glad to have you on this webinar with us today, the 19th day of September 2023. Our focus today is centered around AWS for startups, and we would be treating a very important subject, getting started with cloud computing. It's a fast, it's, a, it's, it's an ever-evolving world today, and um, I'm not sure if the mantra oil is gold is still very realistic, depending on whatever part of the world you you stay, but today I think cloud is becoming gold as data means as as data is becoming a thing in every one of us is living daily by. And I'm that is why we put together this webinar to help us navigate how to get started with cloud computing in the world of in, in the ever evolving technology world. Welcome once again. Can we go to the next slide? So let me just do a quick introduction. So when you get to see Secure Intelligence on any of our socials, on any platform, you would get to see some fine faces like you can see on the screen, um, beautiful ladies and um, gentlemen. So um, we have Adi Juan, Adi Yeye, who is um, a, a driver in the product delivery arm. We have Olani Ajayu is a senior cloud engineer. We have Emeka Nom, who is a product marketing manager. And we have Polanli Ogule, who is a learning and development manager. So these are guys who have put together webinars as this um, for our consumption. As we proceed, it's important I mentioned to us that this session is being recorded and various clips of, from this session would be shared on, on our various social media channels. So you can do well to follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Yeah, just we, we are that social and we drop content that are very relevant in your today's world. And I'm saying in your today's world because, yes, we we come to your space to let you know that whatever it is you are, whatever it is that is your reality, we can actually identify with it and we can provide solutions to to help you live better on that on that premise. During the course of this webinar, you are free to raise your hands, you are, you are free to interact and engage with the content that will be rolled out here. Um, if you look down the icon, you would see um, columns where you can ask questions. Please feel free to use those columns. You would see columns where you can also um, react by emojis. We encourage you to please um, engage us through those um, those beats, we would we, we listen. We are yet to listen to you, and um, we would provide answers to your questions during the course of the presentation or at the end of the presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's just do a quick introduction about Secure Intelligence Limited. C teams are a solution. Um, we are solution builders. We apply technology to drive effectiveness, agility, and growth for businesses. So irrespective of um, the kind of business you run, irrespective of where you find yourself, our organization is such that would um, help you and that would help you and position you to scale globally. The world today is a global village and uh, it's very important that certain things are put together and um, organizations are leveraging on certain things to thrive in that global village. Just as you can see on my screen, the, these are values that we embrace and we would walk you through to become that global enterprise 
in the competitive market today. Um, at this point, I want you to know our facilitator is right in the house. And um, just let's give a warm welcome to our facilitator for today. So, Lou, on, or, um, so now I'm, 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 I'm getting your, your other name twisted. Please forgive me. So, look, can you hear me? Please forgive me. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Victor. My name is Tolu Lopez right now. All right, um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Over to you, Tolu. All right, thank you. Um, welcome once again to Getting Started with Cloud Computing. Um, I'll be taking us through some of the various uh, points we have here at our, you know, our spring from cloud computing through how AWS can give us the solutions that we are going to look at today. Um, in the next slide, um, we're going to talk about cloud computing. I'm sure most of us, we've been thinking, what is the cloud? Is it servers in the cloud? Like on this picture that we have here, are they in the sky? They are not. <laughs> they are not actually. Basically, cloud computing just tells you you can provision IT resources via the internet with pay as you go pricing. And um, on a much lower level, it's basically you requesting for these IT resources from other people that we call cloud yeah. providers. And basically, there are some uh, technology behind it that that have been used to deploy these your resources. So you don't have to um, purchase your own adwares. You don't have to write some invoice, you know, capital expenditure and all those um, costs that you have to run into, like maintaining data centers, um, cooling of your facilities. If you see this guy sitting here now, there are a lot of wires behind him, and you don't need to do all that any longer. Uh, what you just need to do is leverage the cloud. In the next slide, we have um, servers, yes. And the next slide, we see that these are some solutions that we can leverage cloud computing. For example, you have data backup. You have uh, your emails, you have your software development and testing, and you have big data analytics. For the backup, uh, a whole lot of times your data in our today world keeps growing from gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes. And for you to get that infrastructure where you can store that data, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to cost you a lot of capital expenditure. You don't need to worry about that any longer. At a much lower cost, um, we have solutions in the cloud that you can easily just request within minutes and you get your data being backed up. You have disaster recovery. Let's talk a bit about disaster recovery. For example, um, if someone has a data center uh, or your startup, you have a data center, then you, you are you are like, in this era of rain and flood, what happens when the data center is flooded? Or do you always have to look for a hill or a mountain so go and mount your servers? I mean, that's not a very good idea. How many mountains are you going to have to climb to mount your servers? With the cloud, you can easily provision your resources in different regions and in minutes, you can re recover from disaster, depending on your RTO and your RPO and your budget as well in terms of disaster recovery. Now, when we talk of uh, big data, big data we all know is uh, data that is voluminous and it ranges from different sources. So um, the infrastructure that you need to process this, your big data, to analyze the data, yeah, uh, you do not want to have to worry about that. Basically, the cloud gives you that ability to, within minutes, again, work on your data and analyze that big data. In the next slide, we see 
different use cases and different sectors um, beyond the healthcare industry, beyond the financial industry. In other industries like HR and marketing industry, we also are able to leave, leverage the cloud with um, service management tools nowadays that are being hosted in the cloud. And actually, if you have your own service manage, management tool, you can host them in the cloud as an SAP solution. Um, just to bring to the fore here, yeah, we have healthcare companies where you can leverage the cloud to deploy personalized treatments for your patients. And uh, for financial companies, you do fraud detection and prevention using the cloud. And for video gaming companies like chess nowadays, there are a lot of millions of users that use chess, that, that play chess. I mean, where do you want to leverage, where do you want to host those servers? You want to put them in the cloud. In the next slide, these are some of the benefits of cloud computing. We have agility, we have reduced costs, easy move from ideation to implementation. In the past, once when you want, when you have an idea, before you are able to implement that idea, it usually takes you like six months, a year before that ideation becomes a reality. But now with the event of the cloud, you can easily just provision a server within minutes which means that you can deploy your solution globally in minutes. Basically, a whole lot of times you do not even need to over provision. For example, if I want to deploy a solution that I'm expecting 10,000 users, I'd have to start calculating um, how many servers is going to cater for 10,000 users, right? With the cloud, you don't need to do that. Yeah, the cloud offers you um, a feature known as auto scaling, which we'll look at later on. That the more the users, the more the servers that are being deployed, and the lower the number of users, depending on the time, it also scales down. In the next slide, there are different types of cloud offerings based on these two perspectives. We have divided them. We have the deployment perspective. From the deployment perspective, you would see that we have public cloud, private cloud, and the hybrid cloud. Basically, the public cloud refers to cloud infrastructure that is made available to everyone, to everyone over the internet. And uh, we have cloud uh, providers like AWS and other cloud providers that offer this solution. We also have private cloud. And what a private cloud means is that the cloud infrastructure is operated only for your particular organization. So some organizations require that um, their infrastructure and their data is not in anyone else's uh, facility. So you want to opt for private cloud in that sense. And uh, AWS also provides that um, model for you to deploy your solutions. So also we have the hybrid cloud that leverages the functionalities of both. We have federal agencies like the federal government. There are some data that they don't want the public to be aware of. So they want some part of the private cloud. And for the other data that is public, they can leverage the public cloud. The second deployment model we have, the second model rather, we have service model. And yeah, we are talking about um, infrastructure as a service platform as a service and software as a service. In the next slide, we'll see that these are the three service models that you, we have here. And basically, that infrastructure as a service is talking about virtual machines, as we see in the previous slide. And virtual machines, is uh, we still go into virtual machines in more details. Platform as a service, um, you have your web application then you're you're wondering which uh, maybe you wrote a Flask application in Python, or you built a Node.js application, for example, or your React application for your for your startup um, website, and you're saying where do I deploy this my solution? You can easily leverage a platform as a service like AWS Elastic Beanstalk to host your solution. We also have software as a service. Uh, we refer to them as plug and play services. That is, you don't need to 
worry about infrastructure. You don't need to even worry about the application code. So AWS offers some services like uh, machine learning services, text tracks that is to convert um, text to convert your documents to text. Um, these are some of the AWS cloud offerings. We have compute, we have network security, we have storage, we have databases, AI, ML, blockchain, robotics. In the next slide, we'll be talking about uh, AWS compute services. Um, we have EC2, Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. This is your VMs that we spoke about earlier in the infrastructure as a service, service model. We also have AWS Lambda. We have Amazon Elastic Container Service. AWS Lambda is one of the first um, serverless, or we can call it function as a service as well, right? So basically, you just have a code that you want to run maybe once or one million times, right? Your go-to solution is AWS Lambda. So basically, you don't have to worry about infrastructure position, provisioning. AWS has got you covered for that. Now, Elastic Container Service, basically, we have this containerization solution in our world today where um, you want to abstract the, the application from the underlying host, right? So you want to leverage containers in that context. Your go-to solution in the AWS cloud is Amazon Elastic Container Service. And we have many other services. Elastic Compute Cloud is your virtual machine, basically. So um, quick provisioning, like I said earlier, you just go to the management console and you provision your machine, right? And one of the um, technologies that AWS uses behind the scenes is what we refer to as the virtualization technology, where you are able to split your compute into three places. Um, for example, your computers, your desktop computers or laptops, uh, you can leverage the virtualization technology to split that computer into like three other computers. So basically that's what AWS uses to expose this EC2 um infrastructure to the public and there's a solution known as hypervisor that is responsible for sharing that underlying hardware between the virtual machines it's also referred to as multi-tenancy for ec2 configurations we have the when, whenever you want to provision an ec2 instance right there are configurations that you want to select for example do i want a windows server or do i want a linux based server so you can easily choose that while configuring your EC2 instances. And also you can deploy your applications on the fly. Just as you configure your EC2 instance, you can add some predefined configurations, let's say in the user data uh, portion of your configuration. Now, uh, one of the brain busters of EC2 is the fact that you can resize it. So you don't have to provision another instance, basically. What you just do is you stop the instance and then you change the instance type. For example, let's say you pre-calculated that, okay, I need two gigs of RAM for this workload. And while you are performing some monitoring, you see that your CPU utilization is going to around 80%, 90%. That means you are almost going to have that machine born. But what's, what, what can you do? You can just easily stop that instance, right? And resize it to another instance of 4 gigram. And your solution is still on that instance. Let's move. In the next slide, we, we talk about EC2 instance types. So basically, depending on the type of workload, there are different types of EC2 instances. So we have the ones that are for web development, like the general purpose EC2 instance types. We have the compute optimized. These are for high performance computing workloads. And uh, we have the memory optimized for memory intensive tasks, accelerated computing when you need to leverage GPUs as uh, graphical processing units. We also have the storage optimized EC2 instance types for locally stored data, 
like data we have, like databases, if you want to host your databases on EC2. In the next slide, here we've talked about scaling, right? So this is a quote from AWS CTO when I was, he said, everything fails all the time. So plan for failure and nothing fails. What this basically means is that um, you want to plan for failure, right? So there are two ways to scale, and we'll see how we are going to tie it up to planning for failure later on. We can either scale vertically or you scale horizontally. So like I said earlier, you can resize your EC2 instances, right? So let's say you had the two gig RAM, but you now scale to four gig RAM. That's vertical scaling. Now, what if uh, you have uh, many connections to a single EC2 instance? So now you, you, are, you are talking of network uh, throughput. The network throughput is going to go low. Basically, what you want to do there is to provision many more, many other servers, right? Other servers. So what you're going to leverage here is going to be horizontal scaling, not that kind of vertical scaling. The next slide, we talk about auto scaling, introducing EC2 auto scaling. So it's EC2 auto scaling is a feature of Amazon EC2 that enables you to automatically add or remove EC2 instances in response to your application demand. Like I said earlier, you don't have to uh, think about I have 10,000 users and I want to, uh, how, how many servers do I need for that? You just start with say three servers and those servers, they scale up to a maximum amount of servers that you predefine in the auto scaling configuration. In the next slide, we have different types of uh, auto scaling as well. We have the dynamic auto scaling this one responds to changing demand dynamically, just from that word. And then there's the predictive scaling. So, and this is usually based on previous um, previous workloads that you've run. So this type of scaling leverages machine learning. And now let's move to elastic load balancing. This is another service in the compute side of AWS, and it serves as an orchestrator. For example, um, you have three servers, but you have one endpoint for each of those servers, right? So you now have three endpoints, and you want to expose only one endpoint to your customers, right? How do you achieve this? Basically, you have to have a solution that works as an orchestrator that distributes the traffic to whichever server is available. So that is where we see the elastic load balancing. In the next slide, elastic load balancing is a service that automatically distributes your application traffic to EC2 instances and it acts as a single point of contact for all your incoming web traffic. In the next slide, AWS messaging and queuing services, um, quickly run through this. It's used for decoupling your services and for distributed architectures. For example, you have um, a task that is going to take long to process. You do not want to wait for a response, right? We call those type of tasks asynchronous tasks. Basically, what you do is you drop that request for the task into a queue. And this decouples your application from one another. And when you drop that into a queue, your consumer application can easily work on that queue. Producing Amazon SQS, simple queue service, and Amazon SNS. In the next slide, the AWS global infrastructure. So we've talked about EC2, we've talked about elastic load balancing, we've talked about queuing services. Before we move further, I would like to talk about the AWS global infrastructure. Um, the idea behind global infrastructure 
is a matter of high availability and fault tolerance. So when we talk of high availability, is we're talking about how available how available your service is. That is to say, are you experiencing downtime in your service? For example, if a user goes to access your service, will they find your service up? So the idea that AWS brings here is one of regions and availability zones. So regions basically means data centers are located in different countries, for example, in the US or in a part of the US like California or North Virginia. And then in India, let's say in Mumbai or in Africa, South Africa, in Europe, let's say in Ireland, that is a region. And in those regions, we can have various data centers, various other data centers that are connected to each other via high-speed fiber network. Those data centers, we refer to them as availability zones. In the next slide, we'll see um, in the next slide, please. Availability zone is a single data center. So let's 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 come back to our traditional data centers. We've talked that we've said that we have we can have our own data centers, right? But talking of high availability, fault tolerance, disaster recovery, you know, you want to maintain an SLA to your customers and Having just one data center, what happens when that data center goes down, right? So that is where availability zones come into play. So you have availability zones, different availability zones in a single region. So we see here in that second point that each region is made up of multiple data centers or availability zones. Now, a tip given by AWS is that you should run your workloads across at least two availability zones in a region to maintain high availability. In the next slide, we also have edge locations when we're talking about the global infrastructure. Edge locations basically talks about uh, locations where CloudFront is able to pick, cache your data all around the world to aid faster delivery of content to your users. Edge locations also run Route 53, which is a domain name server system. In the next slide, we also have AWS Outposts. This one refers to you running AWS in your own building. And we can also refer to it as a private cloud offering. In the next slide, here are some key pointers to note on the AWS global infrastructure. We have regions. Regions are what they are geographically isolated areas. And for the regions, they contain availability zones. So you can have two or three availability zones in a given region. Edge locations run Amazon CloudFront. We'll also talk about CloudFront later on. In the next slide, um, we've talked about EC2. We've talked about many other services. Now, how do we provision these AWS services? There are three principal ways by which we provision AWS services. We have the AWS Management Console, which I will show us in a demo session. We also have the AWS Command Line Interface for making API calls through your terminal. And we have the AWS Software Development Kit. To note, uh, every thing in AWS, every service in AWS can be, let, can be accessed through an API call. Other tools for interacting with AWS services include um, Elastic Beanstalk. We've talked about that before. Basically, you just write your code and uh, upload it to an Elastic Beanstalk environment, and your application is up. We also have Cloud Option and Terraform, which helps you to define your AWS resources in, via code. In the next slide, yeah, yeah, some best practices for deploying 
AWS services. Next slide, let's go to the next slide. Now we are moving from compute to networking. AWS Virtual Private Cloud is your own private network in AWS. So what this gives you is the ability to isolate a section of the AWS cloud to yourself and resources such as EC2 instances and databases, you can easily provision into these private networks. And this enables network configuration and security like firewalls. The next slide. The virtual private cloud can also be subdivided into has some features like subnets. For example, the word, from the word subnet, you have sub and nets, right? So nets is basically a network and sub means a section of your network. So the subnet is a section of the AWS VPC. And in that subnet, you provision your EC2 instances. We also have the internet gateway. How do I reach the internet since I now have a virtual private cloud, right? I have a virtual private network, my own separated solution. You want to leverage what we call internet gateway. So this basically allows traffic in and out of your VPC. In the next slide, we also have um, the virtual private gateway, which only allows you, um, depending on the type of uh, workload that you are running, maybe you don't want any other person to have access to that workload, and you already have an on-premise data center, and you still want to leverage the AWS cloud, you can work via a virtual private gateway where you just configure your routing connections using um, DPG, virtual private gateway. There's also AWS Direct Connect. In the previous slide, there's also AWS Direct Connect. Uh, this gives you a dedicated doorway or network connections with low latency. Now, uh, um, VPG, that's virtual private gateway and direct connect, they are very similar in that um, it's only for your approved networks, right? But the virtual private gateway can still be breached because it's going over the internet. While for direct connect, you are actually connected through a dedicated fiber. And this is uh, using uh, AWS's direct connect locations. In the next slide. So we'll be talking about all these uh, AWS services. Here is a picture illustrating the AWS cloud network. Uh, this is a client here making a call over the internet to access your service. And your services are sitting on EC2 instances, maybe in your public subnets. The next slide. Now uh, for your network infrastructure, you want to harden your network infrastructure because you do not want just anybody. You know, there are people that are looking for your data, right? And you want to be secure. So AWS advises you to only grant access to specific resources. For example, if we look at the next, the previous slide now, we see that we have, we have a public subnet, we have a private subnet. Now for this public subnet, it could be my web servers. It could be a web server where my web application is sitting on, right? And basically I do not, I, only, I want clients from the internet to be able to reach that server. But for the private subnet, it could be a middleware application that is sitting there. I do not want, the internet to reach that private subnet. What do I do? I want to harden the network in that case. In that case, the next slide. So, introducing uh, your firewalls, you have network access control lists and security groups. For the network access control list, it's a subnet subnet level security infrastructure, which means that it operates at the subnet layer. Now. Uh, this basically just allows access in and out 
of your subnets for specific packets or data, data um, um, for locations. For the security groups, there are instance level security rules. Basically, this uh, allows traffic in and out of your EC2 instances. The next slide. Here we talk about AWS global networking. Uh, I've talked about CloudFront before, but uh, let me sit on CloudFront. Uh, AWS content delivery network service, and it helps deliver edge content to your users would uh, deploy something similar to CloudFront today. And we'll see how you can use CloudFront as well in later webinars. In the next slide, moving from networking, let's move to storage. Uh, there are different types of storage in AWS. Uh, I'll start with block level storage. Basically, you have instant store volumes, which are storage um, volumes that are directly attached to your hosts. Now, if you remember when we were talking about EC2 instances, we said that these EC2 instances are basically virtual machines that operate on an underlying host. For example, your laptop, right? Now, this your laptop has three other virtual machines. So it's split into three already. Now, the underlying, uh, in the instance volume is like your hard disk, the hard disk in your computer yeah. itself. And basically what happens there is that you can easily write data to it. But a catch for the EC2 instances, whenever you provision EC2 instances, is that if you stop or you restart the EC2 instance, it's not sure that it's gonna be on the same computer. It's gonna be on the same, but on the same server. So, for, EC, for instance store volumes, we usually do not want to write important data there. You only write data that can be easily created, recreated, because you're not sure that you're going to get that data any longer. Now, to um, cater for this uh, limitation, Amazon introduces Elastic Block Store, which we have in the next portion of this, sl this slide. And they're basically virtual hard disks attached to your EC2 instances. And they are not tied to that uh, underlying physical host, right? Um, for EBS, uh, we call them EBS. For EBS volumes, you can define the size. Is it 30 gig you want? Is it one terabyte you want? You can de de define the type and the configuration mode. So they are basically persistent block storage. Uh, I still want to speak to something in this slide, if we can scroll down. Okay, in the next slide, okay, it allows for incremental backup. That's your EBS. Um, basically what that means is that your block store, your elastic block store does not, um, the way it stores the, the files now, if you have a text file, for example, you have I am Tolu, for example, now. So then you say I am Tolu something else in the next um, document, for example. It already stored I am Tolu, right? So that something else is being attached. So we refer to that as incremental backup. What this does is that what this helps with is the fact that it doesn't um, take so much memory when you write to the disk any longer, unlike another type of storage which we will look at. In the next slide, so we have Amazon S3. This is a, a simple storage service, basically helps, helps you to store and retrieve unlimited amount of data. So S3 is a perfect solution for your data backup and for data recovery, because you can actually store objects up to five terabytes of data. And you can store unlimited amount of objects in a bucket. So S3 gives you the idea of a bucket. A bucket basically represents like a folder on your desktop, right? Where you have files sitting inside of it. 
S3 can also be used for static website hosting as well. The next slide. We have different data tiers that S3 exposes to you. We have the standard tier that is for data that you want to retrieve very frequently. We have the S3 infrequent access for infrequently accessed data. We have the Glacier flexible retrieval data tier for audit data, that is data that you don't require frequently. We also have the idea of S3 lifecycle policies. Basically, this helps you to automatically transition between tiers. For example, you have a data set that you want to transition to, let's say, from standard to infrequent access within 30 days. Then after, say, 90 days, you want to move to Glacier. You can use an S3 lifecycle policy for that. Uh, just a quick note, Glacier retrieval, flexible retrieval, and S3 standard infrequent access, they have similar, but S3 Glacier instant retrieval is cheaper. So you can save up to 68% lower cost for using S3 Glacier instant retrieval. Now for the Amazon Elastic File System, this is another service, a storage service that um, we can attach to many EC2 instances. Now we've talked about block store, right? Elastic block store. So basically Elastic block store, you attach it only to one instance type or one EC2 instance. But for Elastic File System, you can attach it to multiple instances. And another brain buster is that you can access your data at the same time. If you ever tried to access data on your phone and on your laptop at the same time, if you connect your phone to your laptop, you see some performance issues. But the Amazon Elastic File System abstracts those issues from while accessing data, right? Another point for this Elastic File System is that it's a Linux file system. And we understand that Linux file systems have a very high performance index. Let's move um, in the next slide. We've talked about a lot of storage services, right? Let's move to databases. Uh, we talk about Amazon Relational Database Service. And this is basically a type of database it's an AWS managed database service that enables you to run your relational databases in the AWS cloud. A relational database is a type of database that helps you to store relational data. That is data in tables, like your customer data or your sales data. One of the features and the provisions of Amazon relational database service is that it provides automated patching, backups, redundancy, and it also helps you with disaster recovery by giving you what we call read replicas. So you can actually have many replicas of that database. I'm sure if you've ever tried to provision a database before, you'll see that after some time, the you have to always update and carry out some patches to the underlying hardware. What you are benefiting from Amazon RDS is that you have automated patching, you have backups, you have much better performance. In the next slide, we have AWS's most managed database service. So we have two types, two flavors for this Amazon Aurora, MySQL and PostgreSQL. Uh, this Amazon Aurora is an optimized database service solution. For the MySQL, it's five times faster and five times more performant than the traditional MySQL database. And for the PostgreSQL, it's three times more performant. And you can easily get this Amazon Aurora for one tenth the cost of commercial databases. So that's a lot. If you need a database for your startup, just come for Aurora straight up for your relational databases. 
I mean, you can deploy up to 15 read replicas in different regions. For example, you have a global application that you want to deploy. You just move to Aurora for your relational databases. It also grants you continuous backup to Amazon S3, and you also have points in time recovery for your database. In the next slide, we have Amazon DynamoDB, and this is a serverless key value database, a NoSQL database where you don't have to think about the schema upfront. You can just start saving your data, and afterwards, you can easily query that data in milliseconds. So it offers you the ability to scale as well, infinitely, infinitely scale. So you don't have to worry about how much memory on like, let's say your relational database, you usually provision the, the size of the memory beforehand. Although for the RDS, you can also increase the memory size. And for Aurora, like I said, Aurora also scales infinitely because we have the Aurora serverless. In the next slide. Yeah, we're going to come to responsibility. So now we've been talking about the cloud, the cloud, which means that anything I put on AWS is AWS's business, right? Uh, not really. So there are two sides to this shared responsibility model. We have AWS's side of responsibility and you as a customer, your side of responsibility. So AWS is basically responsible for security of the cloud. And what this means is that it's responsible for your hardware, the, the hardware that they use. It's responsible for the regions, it's responsible for the availability zones, it's responsible for the educations. Um, some of the things that you used to understand this is um, a service that AWS exposes known as the AWS Health Service. Um, basically, sometimes in some regions, if there's going to be a downtime, AWS is going to, um, through that AWS Health Service, is going to inform you before time and give you other options that you can use. Also for the compute and the storage layer, AWS is responsible for that. Why you as a customer, you're responsible for encrypting your data, keeping your data secure and your operating system, your customer data. And this responsibility model also depends on the type of deployment model or the type of service model now that you choose. In the next slide, talk about AWS security, AWS identity and access management. Now, how do I manage permissions and how do I manage access to my AWS environment? So when you start with AWS, you have what we know called the AWS account root user. That's the, um, the credentials that you use to log on or sign up for AWS. You have your username and the password, right? And your email and your account details and everything that you use to sign up with AWS. And this root user basically gets permission to do whatever. That means you can do, you can provision any amount of EC2 instance. You can access any resource. Uh, AWS advises that you do not uh, perform routine tasks with these root users, right? Because for example, if someone has access to the root user account, he can provision a blockchain service and start to do many things that you might not find funny on your cloud. We also have IAM users, that is users that uh, you want to access your system. For example, if I have a developer in your startup and he wants he only needs access to provision EC2 instances. Basically, you can create that user and then you grant access to the user via what we call IAM policy. In the next slide, we talk about IAM roles and IAM groups. So, like I said, we have a developer, but we can have more than one developer, right? For that developer or those developers, we can group them into what we call IAM groups or data scientists or security specialists. 
or marketing specialists or your accountants. You can have an IAM group for them. Now let's talk about IAM roles, which is your third uh, identity in the AWS Identity and Access Management System. IAM roles basically uh, grant permissions to AWS resources, to users, and to external identities and application via temporary credentials. So how this works is that sometimes you have not just only people, individuals like you and myself, but you want some resources like an EC2 instance to so have access to, let's say, another resource like S3. So what you do there is you create an IAM role and you deploy it to that, you attach it to that EC2 instance, for example, with permissions to do what? To access, let's say, Amazon Simple Storage Service, which is S3. You can also map corporate identities to IAM roles for federated access to AWS resources. What that means is that for your corporate identities like Azure Directory or your internal organization, you can map IAM roles for them to have access to resources. Um, before we conclude this session, we are going to have a demo. And this demo is uh, about deploying a static website to Amazon S3. Uh, I will share my screen from this point. Okay, just want to confirm if we can see my screen. Can we see my screen? All right. So we can see your screen. Yeah, so welcome to the AWS Management Console, right? So here are some of the services that I've talked about. You can see S3, you can see EC2, DynamoDB, we have many other services. Basically, we're going to deploy a website to S3. I easily access the S3 from the console. You can see, I just clicked on S3. And then I can create a bucket. Remember, a bucket is a folder, right? And I can call this uh, and uh, one thing to note is that bucket names are globally unique. That means you can have the same name for every bucket that lives in AWS has a different name. So this is my bucket. And here, I want to do what I want to make this bucket host a website. What do I do? After creating the bucket, I move to the properties tab, right? And then I go straight down to static website hosting. And then I click enable and I have an index.html file that I'm going to upload later. Uh, okay, so I save here. Yeah. Then under the permissions, I have uh, to edit this public access. So by default, it's blocked for security purposes, but for this uh, demo, I'm going to disable it to enable static website hosting so that you and I can access the website. Now I'll come back to that bucket policy. And uh, from here on, I will upload my, my index.html file. Now, after uploading, 
uh, we're going to have an issue, but we're coming back to the issue. Once I click it now, access denied. So there is a there is a catch actually. The catch is in the permissions. So that's where IAM comes into place. You remember the concept of roles and um, privilege. So AWS encourages what we know call the least privilege um, principle. And what that means is that you only grant access to resources that you want or people that you want them to have. Now I'm posting a policy here, uploading a bucket policy, which states and allow for the effect to everybody. This star means everybody. And then I attach my bucket name here, which means that everybody can do a get object on this particular content or the contents in this bucket. So when I save the changes, okay. Uh, so I made a mistake there. Yeah. And I refresh. Cloud Computing Rocks with AWS. How secure intelligence limited help deliver your AWS solutions for your startup. Thank you. Over to you, Victor. Oh, thank you very much, Tolu. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful presentation so far. Thank you very much for taking us through those very integral and important aspects of meeting. I can see some um, MOG reactions. Yes, let's bring it up. Let's bring it up. Awesome. So um, without wasting much of our time, we'll just go straight to asking questions and um, Tolu would have spent time to answer them. So, uh, Tolu, there is this question here for you. What are some common challenges or considerations that you think organizations will face during the trans their transition phase? What are the common challenges you think organizations will face and how can these challenges be mitigated? The two-in-one question. Did you get it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, one of the challenges organizations usually face is uh, when you want to transfer your data, your data from your on-premise or wherever you are hosting that data before to the AWS cloud, uh, you usually want to have a partner your intelligence help you understand the data and which service in AWS kind of fits to your use case, right? So that is a challenge and that is a solution. Uh, for example, if I have a MySQL database and I want to migrate to the AWS cloud, I'll be like, which service is going to fit, right? So someone can come up with RDS, my SQL, my SQL label. Another person can come up with Aurora. Another person can say, why not just move to DynamoDB? So we have different types of migration patterns, actually. And that is why we are here to help you with which one fits your use case. I want to believe I have answered that. Perfectly, so um, perfectly. Another question here reads, um, I, I believe you mentioned and that's why you were presenting the earlier part of the presentation. That was the person is so you could just do a quick um, 20, 30 seconds recap. What are the key benefits of cloud computing 
for businesses or individuals that who are just starting to explore this technology okay so you get to test your services in a matter of minutes you can also deploy globally in minutes right for example i want a server and i want to deploy an application on the server i can quickly just go to ec2 spin up an ec2 instance right upload my configuration data and get my endpoints up and running then i test it so if you have a solution that you want to deploy i want to make available you can leverage different services for example, Elastic Beanstalk, if you don't know how to work with EC2 properly, you can easily leverage Elastic Beanstalk, which is a platform as a service solution from AWS. Okay, I, I find this particular question very interesting and practical. So this person is asking, what are the key differences between various cloud service models, Tolu? Um, such as infrastructure as service, platform as service, and software as a service. Then the other part of the question is, how do I choose the right one for my for, for my organization? Okay, so um, it depends on your use case, right? And then there are other factors like uh, technical ability. For example, in the infrastructure as a service, you have your virtual machine. So it's like bare metal, right? You would have to start configuring uh, patches, patches and uh, updating configurations if you have an EC2 instance. For example, there is also AWS Lambda. Now, AWS Lambda, if I had in, let's say, 2019, I had a Python application that was leveraging Python 3.7. In December, Python 3.7 is no longer supported in AWS Lambda. So what, what are you going to do, right? So it depends on your technical ability. For that kind of solution, you want to go for a platform as a service solution where you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure or whichever type of uh, Python version you are going to use. Now, we also have the software as a solution service, like I mentioned, which is the plug and place solution. And basically what happens there is that you just call the API and it gives you the required results. For example, Amazon recognition is, a, is an AI ML service for object detection, and for facial recognition, right? So it can recognize that you are a maker and me, I'm Tolu from our images. Basically, I don't have to build any machine learning models, right? Okay. Well, if you have a data scientist in the house, you can probably leverage Amazon StageMaker, which is from an IAS perspective in the service model deployment. Thank you very much for that, um, that clarification. I believe the person who has that question is clear enough. One more question here, and um, so we would let you run and attend to other business for the day. As a business, what level expect, what level of experiences do I need to look out for in an engineer to be certain they have the right amount of knowledge to get started with these services? Did, did you get that question, Tolu? Uh, yes, yes. What level of experiences do I need to look out for in an engineer? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't take certain health cases to an intern doctor. And as much as I know, he's already almost a doctor. Uh, so I believe this person is asking, what was the level of, expert, of ex, expertise I should be looking at? How do I measure it? Okay, so to answer that. Uh, let me divide that question into your factors that you want to consider when you are for example searching for an engineer and uh, you are you're also looking at the right amount of knowledge right yes yes, yes. okay 
So depending on the project that you handle, that is how and how quick you want your solutions. That's how the type of engineer or the level at which your engineers are, you want to be. Or experiences now, what level of experiences you want to see his ability to, to leverage those services that he says he can use, and if those services tie to your business use case. So everything boils down to the business use case at the end of the day, how you're able to tie from business use case to the technical side of, of how they're going to implement that business use case and to the delivery. How long is that engineer going to take? So there are some, uh, structured tests or questions that you can always pose to the engineer in question for you to understand how much of technical knowledge that your engineer has. I don't know well, if I'm just, just to, um, I just to, I believe, I believe you did. Excuse me, I believe you did. Um, I would just add one thing. And I think one other thing you could also look out for is um, the program that, that this um, engineer is very, very familiar with. Um, that I'm, by provider, I mean the cloud service provider. Um, there are engineers who are very strong using AWS provider. There are some who are very strong using Azure and um, so you know, you know, you know them. I just wanted to just add to that bit. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think that's it. Um, no other question is really in. Thank you very much um, for, for for bringing more clarity to those questions. We mentioned that we spoke about them during the course of your presentation, and we spent um, a good no, a good number of time again reiterating on them. And I believe um, the guys who have asked those questions are are well satisfied, and they would be doing a lot with what they have learned in today's in today's session all right, all right so let me go back to i have anything on the screen before i do a close up okay so just before we do um just before i do my thank you address i just want can you please take me back to that speech where we talk about um secure intelligence thank you Might be wondering um so um in secure intelligence this is what we do we don't just um invite you to webinars we invite you to webinars to let you know that this is a fast evolving world and in as much as it is a fast evolving world the, the space of cloud computing the place of um the space of cloud technologies is evolving as fast as evolving can be. And our, our organization is structured in such a way that we can position you for great exploits. We can interpret your dreams. We can build infrastructures and architectures for you, um, for your businesses, no matter um, the strength of the business and help you to scale globally. So you could, if you wanna reach out to us for further engagement and further interactions, please do not hesitate to do that. I I shared the faces of some persons that you would most likely from now on begin to get newsletters from writings from these writings are um, they spent time to, to send to reach out to you personally. Juan would be reaching out to you, Volandi would be reaching out to you, you would be hearing from a maker and Nili Olani respectively. I mean look at these guys ask the kids I mean, very cute and lovely people. I've interacted with them, and I can tell you for a fact that they would be up and ready to attend to your need and provide when necessary. So, till we come your way again, thank you very much for being part of today's webinar. I am Victor, and I'll see you at our next webinar. Maybe I'm, I might not be one driving. But see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Bye for now. Enjoy the rest of your day.